Norman, now it's time for our mailbag section. And of course, our listeners know already that they can send their questions to us by emailing healthreport at abc.net.au. Uh, Justine's got a question wondering whether there's any good completed studies which demonstrate the use of vitamin D or other supplements which reduce the overall loading on the brain and the central nervous system's response to pain. Uh, Justine's been in chronic pain since the delivery of her first child 11 years ago. Her vitamin D levels levels dropped then, and she's just wondering what the link might be between vitamin D and this chronic pain condition. Um, well, I can't give Justine uh, specific advice, not that I'm necessarily qualified to give advice anyway, and we can't give advice on this uh, question and answer session, but we can talk about some of the evidence. So I'm not aware of very much evidence in terms of vitamin D and chronic pain. Um, it might not be a surprise that vitamin D levels could fall in somebody with uh, chronic pain because you may not be getting out quite as much. You might be more disabled. I don't know what the nature of the pain is. Um, what's much more relevant to people with chronic pain is your is how you're managing it psychologically. So that's not saying that the pain is in your mind, but how you the, the, the state of your mind, if you like, does affect your perception of pain and your ability to manage it. And so there, there's a program, for example, at um, Royal North Shore in Sydney, which is actually a two-week program, which reteaches people about managing their pain. And one of the criteria for getting on that program when you've got chronic pain is that you're off all medication altogether. So you're on no pain relieving medication altogether. And you learn psychological, physical um, strategies to help you manage your pain. They don't promise to get rid of the pain, but they help you to manage it and get better. So I think when you've got chronic pain, a chronic pain syndrome of any kind, you've got to talk to your GP about a multifaceted approach. The problem is a lot of chronic pain clinics have long waiting lists and you need more than one specialist, if you like, expert to help you out. You need psychologists, you need exercise physiologists, uh, you need pain specialists and others to manage the process to hit, because it's multifaceted. And, um, and really, uh, Justine's right, it is a neuro dysfunction. It's that the, there's been a cross circuit in the brain and whatever the initial damage was, you're just left with a perception of pain. Well, not just, you are left with a perception of pain. And um, as we've said many times on the health report, the brain, mind and body are all one. And if you can actually get the way you're responding to this in your brain sorted, you will help the pain. It won't necessarily take it away, but it will help. So probably not as simple as a vitamin D supplement. No, and you've got to watch vitamin D um, tests. They're not reliable, uh, which is why the government removed the subsidy on a lot of them. Um, They don't necessarily give you an accurate idea. And taking vitamin D supplements is cheap and pretty low risk if you talk it over with your GP. And you know if it helps, it helps. But I can't imagine why it would help. But if it does, that's great. Th- think about your life as a whole and you, th- your psychological state, how you're coping with this, and see if your GP can organise some multifaceted care for you. Mm. Um, a question from Annie on the back of the interview that I did last week about a possible co- association between osteoporosis and cognitive function, Annie had transient global amnesia lasting about eight hours at that strange phenomenon where people just have no short-term memory at all. It was a very scary experience for her partner. She also fractured her patella, her knee bone, five months ago and has been diagnosed with osteoporosis. She's wondering whether there's an association between the two. The answer is I don't know. I mean, you can talk about this. The, the, the relationship was with osteoporosis and cognitive decline in dementia, wasn't it, Tegan? Yeah, and it sort of seemed to be that they could see that this this was a, a correlation that went in both directions. There wasn't really a clear cause of either. It seemed to me, well, my understanding of uh, the expert that we spoke to was that there might be risk factors that increase for both of them, but they haven't been identified. The big problem that I really took away from that conversation was that these two disciplines, and indeed lots of different medical disciplines, are not great at talking to each other. So finding these correlations can be quite tricky. And Transient Global Amnesia will refer you to our, if you go to our website, you can find, uh, we had a great documentary on the health report made by Dasha Ross, talking about her experience of transient global amnesia, and she spoke to some of the experts in the area internationally. And there, it, there really is no relationship. There doesn't seem to be any relationship between transient global amnesia and dementia. Uh, some people believe there might be a little bit, but probably not. So if the relationship 
as Tegan says, tenuous as it is in terms of cause and effect, is with dementia, it's very unlikely to be related to transient global amnesia. Susie's got a question about uh, probiotics or uh, the healthy bi- microbiome. She's fully breastfed her three-month-old baby boy, but she had a long labour. She received antibiotics when she was in um, labour and also had antibiotics after she had the baby and the baby also needed antibiotics after birth. She was really wanting a vaginal birth so that she could give him the best start in life as far as kickstarting a healthy microbiome. And had also hoped that breastfeeding would repair any damage that might have been done to his developing microbiome. But she's since learned that the helpful bifidobacteria, which is present in breast milk, uh, often is absent in the breast milk of mothers who've received antibiotics. What can she do about this? How long will it take for the bifidobacteria to return to her breast milk? Well, I'm not an expert in this, but the evidence would suggest that um, your microbiome can bounce back very quickly although the effect of long-term antibiotics is really poorly understood and could have longer-term effects. And there are two strategies that people are recommending at the moment. One is prebiotics, and that really means your diet. Are you eating a diet that's not too doesn't have too much red meat in it, in other words, a Mediterranean-style diet, that actually can produce a very healthy microbiome within a few days. And then people are suggesting, obviously, fermented foods like yogurt. And you can take probiotic supplements, although people are not sure the extent to which those work. But you're better using the fresh ones. You probably, most people would say you should use the fresh ones, the ones that are in the fridge and the pharmacy. Um, and that combination can repopulate your bowel and then presumably from there your breast milk. So I, I just think it's a, it's a process, but w- which not many people really fully understand. Uh, we had a microbiologist, Dr. Lisa Stinson from the University of Western Australia, as one of our top five scientists a few months ago. And she actually wrote an article about this and how to give babies the best start to life when it comes to their microbiome. And yes, breastfeeding is one of those things, but she also suggests things like thinking about getting a pet, um, again, avoiding unnecessary antibiotics and, and that prebiotic diet, like you, like you mentioned, Norman. Um, so, and also uh, letting your baby play in the dirt, but probably not when they're only three months old. <laughs> and one last question from Eric, who's asking, what exactly is polymerase chain testing? So this is the PCR testing that we've heard so much about over the COVID pandemic, Norman. So PCR is polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it goes back many years and... Essentially, polymerase chain reaction is about reading off a very small amount of genetic code that you might detect in a sample and then amplifying it up um, so that it's at detectable levels that you can measure in a test. And that's, that's basically it. And when you've heard of the CT value, well, essentially, that's really a measure in with the COVID testing of how many times you've got to amplify it up to detect it. And the more times you've got to multiply it uh, and amplify it up, the less virus there is there. Why is the PCR test uh, considered to be the gold standard? Because it's very good at detecting very tiny amounts of virus. That's, that, that, that's essentially it without actually having to culture the virus. The, the problem with it is that it detects viral fragments and you, you make the assumption that you're infectious when you may not be. So you've got to actually got to take it in the context of the person's story. So you may, it may be negative in the early stages when there's not very much virus around and even the PCR test can't amplify it up. And it may be positive for a long time after you've actually stopped being infectious because you produce these viral fragments. So there are problems with it, but at detecting virus at very, very low levels, it's excellent. Well, that's all I've got for you in the mailbag today, Norman. And of course, listeners, you can email us, healthreport at abc.net.au, with your questions and comments. We welcome them all. Uh, we'll catch you again next week. See you then. 